Well, thanks very much. Uh, this is part of a, a two-day MRI academic conference which is currently going on at Merchant Ventures where I've been all morning. Um, and the suggestion was that we should have a public lecture uh, at the same time. And I'm slightly humbled by the fact that there are more people at this lecture than there are at the conference. I'm not sure the conference organisers are so comfortable about that. Um, but anyway, I'm uh, Roy Jones. I'm a geriatrician by background. Um, I run RICE. Uh, some of you, I, I recognise some faces, so some of you are aware about RICE. It stands for Research into the Care of Older People. It's been going in Bath since 1985. Um, and I started the memory clinic there in 1987. And uh, you probably know if you're Bristol-based that Professor Wilcox started a memory clinic in Bristol around that time, a bit earlier than mine as well. So both in Bristol and Bath, we've had a history of memory clinics and, and looking um, and doing research from our two centres um, over that time. My background is to try and find drug treatments for Alzheimer's disease and, and, and other conditions, but over the years it's become completely focused on working with people with dementia and memory-related problems. Um, I'm a clinician. I see patients regularly in our memory clinic as well as doing the research. I'm not a radiologist, I'm not an imaging expert. I think that's why they thought I was okay to send over here to do a public lecture, as opposed to talking to all these clever academics who do much more sophisticated things with the image than I do. It is a public lecture, so I have taken it at face value and assumed that many of you don't know very much about uh, the various things. So I'm gonna try and take you through a story over the next, hopefully around 45 minutes. Um, and then if there is um, any questions, I'll be happy to answer them after that. Um, so I'm actually going to start to set the scene by telling you a bit about dementia and the related conditions because it becomes very clear that that's important um, if you're going to understand the imaging that I'm then going to show you. Most of you, all of you, will be familiar with Alzheimer's disease. I imagine that may be one of the reasons why you're here. It is the commonest type of dementia, but it's not the only type. There are probably about 40 or 50 types in total. And dementia is a syndrome that can be caused by a number of progressive illnesses. Usually memory is the main thing to be affected, but not necessarily. Um, but it does affect thinking processes or cognition and behaviour and the ability to perform everyday activities. And, and as those of you who know, and I, I'm well aware there are many here who will be uh, either aware of possibly with dementia or caring for someone with dementia, you will be aware of the huge impact these conditions um, have. The major causes of dementia are listed on this slide. Alzheimer's disease is about half to two-thirds of people with uh, dementia. Vascular dementia is probably around about 15, 10 to 15%. Um, and then a dementia called dementia with Lewy bodies is probably around another 10 to 15%. And then a dementia or a group of dementias called the frontotemporal dementia is probably around 5%. Um, the, um, the, the numbers vary. And the other thing to say, there is an overlap very often, particularly in older people, for instance, people over the age of 80, um, many of them will have a mixture of Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. That would be less common in someone uh, developing dementia at a younger age. So one of the issues, and I'm showing you some old slides now, which hopefully the reasons will become apparent, that the diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's disease, uh, which have been standardised, require that someone has a memory impairment, and then at least one of these four um, things that are listed there that affect uh, thinking processes. Aphasia is a problem with language. Apraxia is a problem with practical things like dressing, getting model of dressing. Agnosia is not recognizing things. For example, it might be the person can't recognize a face, um, even though they've got normal vision, but they can't actually interpret the, the face. And then a disturbance, which is a major issue in what we call executive fun fu function. An executive function really is what you would call multitasking. It's the thing that allows us to juggle different things. It's very important for complex things like driving, um, uh, certain things like cooking a, a complex meal, etc. Um, uh, we need that. And the other bit of the, the, the old definition is that the deficit should be sufficient to interfere significantly um, with occupational functioning and, and, and that that should be a decline. And obviously that will vary very much from person to person. An 85-year-old lady living with her daughter might not need to do as much as a, a 55-year-old bus driver or, or pilot or whatever, and therefore the, what's significant might vary. And it should be a gradual and progressive decline because that's generally how Alzheimer's presents, and it should be there for at least six months to make sure it's not a temporary thing. And as you'll see, it then says not better explained by something else. 
So there's an element where in the past we would diagnose Alzheimer's disease after we kind of got rid of all the other things that we thought of. But gradually over the last years we've moved to a point where we're now being much more positive about making the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease rather than saying, well, there's nothing else to explain the problem, so that's probably what it is. And this is the diagnostic criteria for probable Alzheimer's. We talk about probable Alzheimer's and possible Alzheimer's. And you don't need to worry too much about the details on this slide, but essentially this is establishing from a clinical point of view, from what I see in a person in my clinic, how likely do I think that they have Alzheimer's disease? And I can give them the term probable or possible. So if I'm not sure, I might use the term possible. But if you look at the bottom part of this slide, you'll see that it says definite Alzheimer's disease requires a brain biopsy, which you'll be pleased to know we don't very often do, uh, or post-mortem evidence. In other words, on these old criteria, I couldn't technically say you definitely had Alzheimer's disease until you died and I'd looked at your brain under the microscope. And clearly that's a bit late in the day to, to do that. So if we could find some way in life of being a bit more certain about the diagnosis, it would really be helpful. I'm briefly going to talk about the other dementias uh, that, that I mentioned earlier. So vascular dementia is a mixture of conditions. It includes what we call multi-infarct dementia, where people have had a number of different strokes. It can include a single stroke, particularly if it's in a, an area of the brain that's strategically very important. It can include ge general vascular disease involving uh, other areas of the brain. And, um, uh, and as I said before, there's a big overlap with Alzheimer's disease, especially in, in older people. Dementia with Lewy bodies is a, a slightly less well-known condition. It's been around a number of years now, but you may not be familiar with that. It has elements of Parkinson's disease dementia, so that people often have features a bit like Parkinson's disease affecting their movement. Um, and it also has features a little bit like Alzheimer's disease. But the, the particular characteristics are very often the person's thinking processes vary minute by minute. So if you're actually sat talking to them in the clinic, they may suddenly lose, lose the concentration and appear to stop sort of listening to you and whatever and then come back again. And this happens sort of literally minute by minute. They often have visual hallucinations quite early in the course of the dementia, and that's unusual for any of the other dementias like Alzheimer's, and they usually will have mild features of Parkinson. And then there are various other uh, things that support this. So it's quite an important uh, diagnosis, and, and it needs handling in a different way to Alzheimer's disease. So again, it's a diagnosis we want to be able to make if we can. And then this group of diseases which affect the front part of the brain and also the temporal lobe around the side, uh, there are, broadly speaking, uh, one which is a, a behavioural problem predominantly, where the people don't really present with memory problems, that's called Pick's disease. Um, and then there are various ones which affect aspects of language. Um, and they're called progressive aphasias, and there's another type of dementia called semantic dementia, where people actually lose knowledge. And it's quite different from Alzheimer's disease. For example, if you say to the person, as we do in some of our tests, would you write a sentence, the person may say, what's a sentence? Or we show them pictures of animals and they'll say, if I show them a kangaroo, it's a cat. Um, if I show them a helicopter, they won't say it's a cat. In other words, they can tell the difference between an animal and a non-animal, but they've lost the knowledge. And it affects a different part of the brain. I will show a picture of a patient um, with semantic dementia uh, later. Frontotemporal dementias are commoner in younger people, but we are beginning to see them more often now in some of our older, older patients as, as, uh, as we're seeing more and more people. Then the other important term that I need to just mention to you is something that many of you may be aware of called mild cognitive impairment. Again, it's got a, a lot of different names. Um, this essentially is a grey area between people who are normal and people who definitely have dementia. Um, it's mild because it's not too bad. It's cognitive, which means it affects memory and thinking, and it's impairment. So it's really just a description. Um, and what we see is that these, this group of people are more likely to develop dementia as a group, but not all of them do. Some of them get better uh, over time, some of them stay the same, and some of them do go on to develop dementia. Again, within this group, and we'll talk about this a bit more um, as we go through the talk, uh, this group are a group where if we could identify them, potentially, particularly as we get earlier treatments, it would be really useful if we could find who was going to develop Alzheimer's disease of that group at the, the, at the beginning. There are often abnormalities on imaging uh, the brain in these people, um, and it's been a big res focus for research, particularly um, uh, in trying to uh, find treatments and think about using treatments in people before they get dementia. And again, I'll talk about that a bit more. 
This is a picture of outside. Oh, it's hot. I need a drink. Excuse me. This is a picture of Alzheimer, who described the first person with uh, Alzheimer's disease, after which the name, a lady called Auguste, in 1907. And in his first description um, of the changes that you see in the brain at post-mortem, he described two things that are really important, again, to, to our discussion today. He described what are called Millery foci, which we now call plaques in the brain, um, and he identified them, although he didn't know what they were at the time. And we now know that those plaques contain a protein called beta amyloid. And again, any of you who, who have any involvement in this area will have, will have heard of this. And we know that beta amyloid builds up in the brain of people um, with, with Alzheimer's disease some years before they actually get Alzheimer's dementia. Um, and that's within the plaques. The plaques are outside the cells. He also noticed inside the cells that there were condensation of what he called fibrils and he called them neurofibrillary degeneration. We now call them tangles, and this is a picture of, of the tangles on, on, on the right there. Um, and the tangles contain another protein called tau, and this particular protein leads to the, to the nerve fiber, uh, the, the nerve fibers sort of clogging up and interfering with nerve function. Um, and I'll be talking a lot more about both tau and amyloid as we go through. And they are the cardinal features that you see when you look at the brain of somebody with Alzheimer's disease. This is a more modern picture showing the same things, but showing that Alzheimer's drawings were not that bad. This is a, a, a plaque, um, and you can see it contains, it contains this amyloid beta, this A beta. And then these are the tangles here, and this is a tangled up nerve cell. And it contains this protein tau, which is called hyperphosphorylated tau, because it contains an excess of phosphate uh, groups on it. And this is, again, what we would expect to see if we looked at the brain of the people we've identified with Alzheimer's disease uh, post-mortem. Now, what we know is that this builds up for many years before the person gets uh, dementia. And we know from a number of studies that I haven't got time to go into to great details, but we can talk about it after if we want to, that probably for 10, 15 years or more, the, the, these plaques and tangles start building up in the brain of the person developing Alzheimer's disease, but initially they won't know anything about it. And then they'll get to a certain point where there is enough damage that they start to develop the problems that we recognise as the, the things that, that, that are familiar to us in identifying Alzheimer's disease, although really what we're recognising is Alzheimer's dementia, because you could argue that even back here they have Alzheimer's disease in the sense they've got the abnormalities within their brain. And what we know is that we can, we, we can know, unfortunately, if we did scans on all of you and me and whatever, some of the people in this room, perfectly healthy from a memory point of view, might show some of those plaques and tangles. And that's part of what uh, the talk is about, is about can we do more to identify people at an, an earlier stage. If we then look at this in a slightly different way, um, then we usually make the diagnosis of someone with Alzheimer's disease at this point, when they've got a degree of cognitive problems, a degree of problems with their memory, it gets to a certain point, and as I said, when I showed you the criteria, it's a bit arbitrary. I get to a point where I say, actually, I think there's enough damage here, it's interfering with your life enough for me to say this is probably Alzheimer's disease, rather than I'm not sure what it is, or it's mild memory problems, or you know, we'll watch and, and see. But this is an, an, an arbitrary thing to some degree. In this group here, They've got symptoms. This is where we talk about this group I mentioned called mild cognitive impairment. So the person may be complaining a bit about their memory, but it's quite mild. Um, and this is, uh, can be for a few years or many years before they develop dementia. And as I say, not everyone in this group is going to develop dementia. But those that are developing Alzheimer's disease will gradually get worse. And now we're also talking about a term called prodromal Alzheimer's disease. In other words, Alzheimer's disease before you have got dementia. But equally, there's another period which currently we really don't recognise or, or, or almost never recognise, and that is a, a point where people are totally normal on testing, but they have got these amyloid and tau uh, developing within their brain. And there are a few people, fortunately not so many, but they're really important families around the world who have inherited a gene that means they will inevitably get Alzheimer's disease. And interestingly, that group nearly always developed the dementia at around the same age uh, within the family. So if the father got it when he was 45, the son will probably get it if he's got the gene at 45. So this group are proving really useful from a research point of view because we can pick them up in this few years before they're going to get their dementia and then start to look at them in various ways to see whether treatments 
might help it, etc. Okay, so now we come to the imaging bit. You've got the background now, and of course the Daily Express is always right. Um, it was here only a couple of weeks ago. I thought this is perfect for the time of my lecture. I should say the picture of Cliff Richard there, I think, is inadvertent. I'm not, I don't think they're suggesting that Cliff Richard has dementia. But predictably, a new scan will spot dementia. Well, first of all, it wasn't a new scan. It's been around for quite a while. And it's not quite as straightforward as you might guess. So always read the headlines with, with a degree of, of caution. This is an interesting picture, which I found when I was looking to do this lecture. This is actually the first CT brain scan. Um, Godfrey Hounsfield, working with EMI in London, um, found, uh, invented this technique. And this is the first scan done at Atkinson's Morley in 1971. You can see a circular object there, which is a brain tumour in the front part of the brain. And the surgeon who removed this said it was very helpful. It told him very clearly. And before that, it was really quite difficult to, to do that. Um, the scan took five minutes for each picture, five minutes to interpret, um, and, uh, and not surprisingly, quite complex. And as you can see, it's quite a grainy picture. It's not exactly uh, brilliant. But this was a very big um, step forward. <clears throat> Again, not surprisingly, all the technology was developed in America after that, and, and Britain uh, lost it. I won't get into discussions about whether we should leave the EU or not. Um, maybe I will, actually. <laughs> This is a modern CT scanner, and those of you who've had a CT uh, now, it's, it's not a bad thing. It's not, uh, as you'll see when we start to compare some of the other scanners, it's, it's relatively open. Um, it's, a, it's quite a nice sort of big room that you're in. And a CT scan does involve giving the person x-rays. Um, so that is a, a, a negative, if you like. It's, an, it's, a, it's a standard scan, like chest x-rays and whatever. It's probably equivalent to about 20 uh, x-rays, I think it is. Is, is it about the equivalent? And this is a more modern picture of, of a CT brain scan. And again, you can immediately see, and this is quite an old picture of mine, um, this is really showing just how much better that picture is than the first one that I, I showed you. And on the right, you've got a normal brain, and on the left, you've got a, a person with Alzheimer's. And what you can see is this area here. Um, you can see this area here, which is called the temporal lobe. This area here, which we'll be talking more about, is called the hippocampus because it looks like a seahorse, and the area around that. And you can see that there's much more of that area on the control person than there is on the, on the person with Alzheimer's. And in general, the brain is, is much more shrunken. And they are more or less age-matched patients because that's the other thing. All our brains shrink as we get older to some degree, so we always have to compare and think, well, is this abnormal for someone of 80? or is this abnormal for someone of 50? So that's a, 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 a CT scan, which is readily available now. It takes about five minutes to do now, and we can do a whole picture of the brain to get these lovely pictures, um, and um, it, it's a pretty quick um, uh, and, and relatively cheap test, and really quite widely available. We can do a little bit more. Um, we can start to try and look um, uh, and, and compare the, the, this bit, this, this hippocampus, and try and measure it in certain ways, and compare the control group with the Alzheimer's group and with the group with this um, odd condition, I mentioned this dementia with Lewy bodies, and showing the, the difference. So we can begin to do some measurements on the scan to try and get a little bit more science, a little bit more accuracy into it. And people have come up with a number of ways of, of trying to do this, where you actually measure uh, the size of the hippocampus by hand, you cut, I mean, I, I know one person, even cut, they cut the bits out from the scan and actually look at the bits of paper, or there are computerised ways that people are developing as well. So CT scans have moved on, and for most of our patients, that is sufficient. We probably won't need to do more scans than that in, in, in general, and we'll talk a bit more about that. This is the MRI scanner, which these people obviously think is fun because they're on the other side of it rather than inside it. Um, but those of you, uh, just as a matter of interest, how many in the room have had an MRI scan? My God, <laughs> quite a lot. So you know how noisy it is, and it's quite claustrophobic. Well, they are getting a bit better. I have to tell you a story about one of my Alzheimer's patients at this point who um, had an MRI scan at the RUH, um, and, and he has Alzheimer's, and he, he popped in to see me and said, I thought I'd come in and tell you I've had my scan doctor. I said, oh, fine, very good. I said, how did you find it? He said, oh, it was okay. I said, was it very noisy? Oh, it was, he said, but, uh, but they said I could listen to some music. Um, so I thought that would be nice. And they said, what would I like to hear? And I said, well, I don't know. He said, what about Frank Sinatra? He said, so they put Frank Sinatra on, and now the end is near, and so the final curtain. 
And I thought, I'm not sure you actually have got Alzheimer's disease with a sense of humour like that. Um, this is an MRI picture, again showing that bit that I showed you before, this hippocampus area. And what we know is that in mild Alzheimer's disease, this area is about 10 to 20% smaller than a healthy older person. But it's really quite hard looking at a scan in an individual person to say, well, actually that is 20% smaller or is it abnormal? So trying to decide whether it's abnormal is, is, is a challenge. Um, and so what would be interesting and what we've been starting to do in research studies uh, to try and follow patients in research but potentially we can also do in patients where we're following them and not sure what's happening with their memory related problems is what about if we measure your scan today and then in a year's time we measure it again. Can we find a way of really accurately measuring to compare them? <laughs> because potentially the scan, your position in the scanner may change a bit and, and various things. And, and this is what this is looking at. So these are two scans, uh, uh, 18 months apart, and basically trying to say, well, is that different to that? Um, and, and how easy is that to, to see? Um, and this is, uh, these slides are from a, a friend of mine in London called Nick Fox, who's done a lot of work on this. And what he says is the equivalent of putting two children together in the playground to to, to see how, whether they're the same height or not and they go back to back to compare. What you try and do is you get the two brains and you try and get them to a point where they are in exactly the same configuration so that you know that this picture from this brain is in the identical position to that. And with clever computer technology, etc., that is now quite possible with MRI scans. And so first of all, I'm going to show you a, a healthy older control subject. So this is uh, the first scan they had. And this is a, a, a year later. Now I'll go back again and show it again. And I think you can see there is a little change there. But it's not dramatic. And one of the things, again, we do start to lose a bit more brain as we get older. Um, probably about half a percent a year, maybe something like that, maybe a bit less. Um, and that would show up on this. But that is actually relatively mild, as you'll see from some of the other uh, slides that I'm showing. But it shows you the, the principle. So now we'll take a patient who we're not sure, does this person have Alzheimer's disease? So here is their scan at the beginning, not that different to the, to, to the previous person's, but what you can see if I go through them, and I'll go through them quickly and then go through them again, this is over three and a half years. And if we just go back and go through, you can see easily that the brain is clearly shrinking in quite a, dram a dramatic way and about 3% a year, so that, that this person's brain is losing about 3% in comparison with about half a percent or less. And again, going back to what we were saying, particularly this, this area here, which is the temporal lobes, which are the areas we particularly know are, are, tend to be abnormal uh, in, in Alzheimer's disease. But there is shrinkage in the rest of the brain as well. It's not just uh, in those areas. What about this grey uh, area, this condition called mild cognitive impairment, where this is really of interest, because I'm interested when you come to see me with a mild problem, actually have you got Alzheimer's disease or are you OK? Um, and if potentially I could follow you, and some of our patients we've been following for 10, 15 years watching them, you know, if I could uh, learn a bit more about what's happening, particularly as treatments become available that might be of use to someone like this, uh, it may not be so critical uh, if we don't have any treatments to offer in that we can offer general advice that you can take whether or not you're going to develop Alzheimer's disease. But obviously, as treatments become available, it's going to be important that we give it to the right people. Um, then if I could do these serial scans on this person, and this is uh, the scan at time one, and this is the scan at time two. And again, if I just go, go back and forward, I think you can see again, there's not as much change as in the person that I showed with Alzheimer's, but there's certainly more than that healthy person. And, 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 and yet I could find other slides which I could show you showing somebody with mild cognitive impairment year on year where they haven't changed very much at all. And that's quite reassuring. And obviously when we're trying to put people into research studies uh, who have mild cognitive impairment and we're looking at a drug for Alzheimer's disease, we really want to be sure the person we're putting in the trial has got Alzheimer's disease. Because if we put them in and they've got mild cognitive impairment due to something else, they're not going to benefit from the very specific treatment we're giving them for Alzheimer's disease. And one of the reasons a number of drug treatments probably have failed over the last few years is because of that, that we've actually been failing to identify everyone with Alzheimer's, and the studies include people who don't actually have Alzheimer's, uh, 
And if you then compare them with a group on placebo, obviously it's harder to show that the drug is effective, and, and I'll come back to that uh, as well. Now, these are just some pictures of other types of dementia. This is the, the front part of the brain of this person. It's, a, it's what we call a coronal section, so it's cut through this way and showing the front part, and really shows quite dramatic um, uh, shrinkage in someone with frontotemporal dementia. This is that odd condition I mentioned called semantic dementia. These are the people who lose knowledge rather than why they went into the kitchen and what they were trying to do. And, and it's a different type of problem. And we can see that because what it affects is this, this is the left side, the, the way you, you read these in reverse. This is the left temporal lobe, which you can see is really abnormal compared with the other side. And that's where things like knowledge and, uh, are and that we are learning sort of a lot about this particular dementia that it uh, tends to affect um, the left side more. It can sometimes affect the right. So we can begin to separate out different dementias using scanning. This is a SPECT CT scanner. SPECT, uh, what I've been talking about so far are what we call structural imaging, looking at the brain tissue that's there. But we also are interested in the function. How does the brain actually work? And, and the next few things I'm going to talk about are about the function of the brain. SPECT um, stands for Single Photon Emission Computerized Tomography. So it's got a, a CT scanner within it, but it's using a radioactive label which follows the blood <laughs> supply. So we inject the, uh, the particular um, compound that we're using and it will go and follow where the blood is going according to how it's working. And this is um, an image using this technetium um, compound. And again, these are pretty pictures, but just trying to get the differences. This is a control subject. And what you can see is in someone with frontal dementia, again, these are slices this way, what we call axial slices. So we're looking on the top of the head, as it were. If you look at the front one, you can see that there's, there's a reduction there in the front part of the brain. In the Alzheimer's, it's in this area here, whereas in dementia loop bodies, it tends to be very posteriorly, and we can see the differences. And you can do different scans on different... Uh, in fact, the next slide I show you will illustrate a, a, a different view. And what we can see is that this is a way of helping us when we're not sure about the diagnosis, because this kind of picture, this kind of pattern, is very typical of Alzheimer's. And if the, 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 the doctor doing this saw this picture, he would say, well, this looks more like Alzheimer's, than dementia Lewy bodies if it was there. And NICE, for example, has recommended in the past, although it's reviewing some of these recommendations now, um, that, that, it's a, that it's a useful technique. This is a, a, another scan, a slightly different way of showing the colours, and this one is using a, a cut through this way. So at, at the front of the brain is here and the back of the brain is here. And what you can see is white is very hot, lots of blood to supply, and blue is very bad, and obviously blue, the, the ventricles and the surrounding area of the brain doesn't have anything. And you can see a big gap in this area here. And this is a patient with what we call posterior cortical atrophy. It's a, it's a, 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 a problem that, um, that affects the, the back part of the brain that affects vision, because vision is in this part of the brain. And often posterior cortical atrophy is an abnormal, uh, an atypical form of Alzheimer's disease. And again, we're learning to, to play with these images because that's still quite hard. When I get these pictures coming through to me, I find them quite hard. And there are several other pages of stuff that you get. But we can analyse them in a, with a computer and do various things. And we can then compare that person's picture with a group of normal subjects uh, that we've got data for. And this is called statistical parametric mapping. But what you can see from this picture is when we do that, it becomes really clear where the abnormality is. That's the front of the brain, this is the, the back of the brain. And so again, these techniques begin to help us to sort out which bits of the brain are abnormal and allow us to be a bit more precise uh, about the diagnosis. Now, as well as looking in general um, using SPECT scans, there is a technique called DAT scans. And DAT scans look at a, a, a neurotransmitter, a, tr a nerve transmitter within, a chemical transmitter within the brain called dopamine, which is abnormal in Parkinson's disease. And uh, people have developed a, tr a, a, a marker which will now bind to those nerve cells uh, in the area of the brain that's, that's uh, important within Parkinson's disease, an area called the basal ganglia. Um, and this is a, another uh, technique now, and this is slightly different, um, maybe a little bit harder to see, this is a normal subject. These bits in the middle there are what we call the basal ganglia. And again, you can see the hot bit in the middle, and you can see what's effectively two commas. And that is normal. 
The other thing to be aware of is that around the scan, there's not very much colour other than the blue of the background. And you'll see as we go through the, the other slides uh, why I've shown you that. So that's a normal scan. If I get that in one of my patients who I think might have Parkinson's disease, but they might have just a tremor from some other cause, I can be reasonably reassuring that they're likely to be um, uh, okay. And this, in fact, is, a, is showing exactly that. This is a patient with what we call essential tremor, just... Uh, uh, not due to Parkinson's disease, and you can see they've still got the comma, whereas this is the person with Parkinson's. And this is quite an interesting one as well. This is a series of people with Parkinson's disease who are, uh, who's a, a normal person there, a Parkinson patient there before they're given a, a dose of L-DOPA, the treatment for Parkinson's disease, and showing that actually the treatment then helps to restore uh, the situation a bit. Um, and in dementia with Lewy bodies, which as I said has an overlap with Parkinson's disease, um, this same pattern occurs. And the other thing I mentioned earlier, this is the normal, and if you remember it's bright and hot in, the, in, the, in this area here, but around it it's nice and clean, whereas on that one there you can see that it's, it's not such a clear picture, but also there's quite a bit of what we call non-specific binding. In other words, the, the colour doesn't go right to the bit it should, and that's also helping us, that pattern is helping us to recognise recognise someone um, with, with um, dementia with Lewy bodies. And this has been used now and been compared in post-mortem studies with people with dementia with Lewy bodies, and it's a very useful technique. Again, like many of the things I'm talking about, I do not make the diagnosis only on the basis of the scan. The scan is there to help me. The scan isn't necessary in someone who clearly has Parkinson's disease, and I don't need a clever uh, scan or anything to help me but it's very useful for those people where there's a bit of uncertainty and where we're trying to sort things uh, out. And for example, the difference between dementia with Lewy bodies and uh, Alzheimer's disease, we might treat certain aspects of, for instance, behaviour that the person develops in a different way because the person with dementia with Lewy bodies, for example, reacts very, very badly if they're given antipsychotic drugs, for example, and yet, if you remember what I said about them, they have hallucinations. And many doctors would use antipsychotic drugs to... to, to correct hallucination. So it's really important in that group that we try and get the diagnosis. So now we'll move on another step to more functional imaging where we're trying to look um, and see what's happening. And this is uh, moving towards the state of the art now. This is called a PET-CT or positron emission um, tomography. This, this scanner measures positrons and again it uses uh, radio labelled compounds um, often with carbon, 11 carbon or fluorine. And um, and these scanners are very expensive um, and they're not so widely available. Um, and, um, but in general, they, are, they give a better picture than the spec scan I showed you. And what we are looking at here is not the blood flow to the brain, but the way the, the brain uses glucose for its metabolism. So we're seeing where the brain is using energy. Um, and this is showing you um, on the left a, pet, a series of PET scanner pictures and on the right, a series of spec scanners. This is the same person, uh, or the same people. This is a control subject. This is somebody with Lewy body dementia, and this is someone with Alzheimer's. And you can see the different patterns, but also you can see that the spec picture is a bit more blurry and not quite so clear-cut. And in particular, um, in Alzheimer's disease, for example, this area here, which we call the precuneus, um, is, is often abnormal um, and, and it's not quite so clearly shown in, 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 the, in the SPECT scan. So PET is in general regarded as, as better than SPECT and this is a study from a friend of mine uh, in Cambridge, John O'Brien, who's, who's given me some of these slides and this is where he's compared PET and SPECT and shows that in general, I won't take you through much of this, but this, that if we look at this dementia versus control, what you're looking at is you want the figure for sensitivity and specificity to be as near 100% as possible. And you can see that PET scanning is much better in general than SPECT when you're comparing healthy people with dementia. And then the other group, which is much more useful to us in a sense, is if I'm trying to compare someone with Alzheimer's versus someone with dementia with Lewy bodies, and I'm trying to make that distinction, how good is it? It's not as good as versus controls, but again, you can see that the, the sensitivity and the specificity is much better for, for PET than SPECT. So in general, it's, a, it's a, a better technique, but it's more expensive and it's not so widely available. Now the most exciting thing, and this is the, 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 the last part of the, the talk, as it were, is the fact that we're now moving to what we call molecular imaging. 
because going back to what I said right at the beginning in my long preamble about Alzheimer and Alzheimer's disease, what I said is that in Alzheimer's disease we see plaques and tangles in the brain. And none of the things that I've just shown you are any closer to demonstrating whether someone has plaques or tangles in their brain. But we've now got to a point where we have these markers which actually highlight whether someone has got amyloid uh, in, in their brain within the plaques. And the first compound was this one called Pittsburgh Compound B, not surprising because it was uh, described first in Pittsburgh. Not very useful because it uses carbon, radioactive carbon, which has a half-life of about a few minutes, if that. So for us in Bath, trying to get a sample from the Hammersmith Hospital, it's not going to be very useful. By the time it arrives to Bath, it will be inactive. So it's only really useful in places where they actually can generate uh, an isotope uh, with a, what's called a cyclotron right by the, the scanner. Having said that, Compounds that involve fluorine are much more stable and last a, a few hours, and now it is possible to, 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 to make those available. And there's two, certainly, that are now licensed in the UK for use, um, for beta and for beta and I'm not sure where flutometamol is at the moment. Um, and what they are doing is they're actually showing us the amyloid plaques. And if you look at this, again, look at the top part of this slide. This, remember, just to remind you, this is using this Pittsburgh compound B. This is a healthy control here. And if you go straight along to the Alzheimer's disease patient there, you can see the difference, the yellow and the red color. If you look at someone with Parkinson's disease, they haven't got it. If you look at someone with vascular dementia, they haven't got it. Someone with frontal dementia hasn't got it. But someone with mild cognitive impairment has got a certain amount of it. Again, illustrating the fact that mild cognitive impairment is... Uh, for many people, a halfway house on the way to developing dementia. And interestingly, there's a little bit in the patient with dementia with Lewy bodies. Again, which, as I said, is, is not uncommon that there's an overlap with these things. So that this begins to give us something much more specific. Now, the, the practical issue is that this is not readily available. It's expensive, um, and it is being used in research. And where we're using it in research at the moment is to make sure that patients we put into clinical trials of new treatments that will act on amyloid in the brain of someone with Alzheimer's, that they actually have got amyloid in, the, in their brain. And so now our patients are having that. And this um, shows you again just uh, an illustration. The top one, again, you'll realize that actually you need quite a lot of experience to really decide what's positive and what's negative. There are quite strict criteria, but in general, obviously these are meant to be quite good examples. There'll be a lot that would be more borderline this, but you can see that this is the, the three views. So this is the axial view through the head that way, um, the, 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 and, and the coronal views. I think I can't see from here what they are. And you can see the red, which is all the amyloid, and this, this one is much less marked. And, and so this begins to give us... Um, uh, a, a really useful thing. And just for comparison, I've put the two types of, of scan. If you remember, I showed you the glucose um, uh, PET scan, which is showing um, the circulation. This is a control subject showing circulation, um, the, the glucose within, within the control subject. And then this is the subject with Alzheimer's disease. And you can see the areas that are much reduced um, compared with this subject. Whereas using the, the amyloid agent, this is a control subject, this same subject hasn't got anything at all there, whereas the, control, the, the patient with Alzheimer's has got a lot of amyloids uh, across the brain. Now, this became quite exciting. Uh, we've all been interested in this, but this got into the newspapers um, recently. This is a study with one of these immunizations called aducanumab. Again, you don't need to read the whole of the slide. Aducanumab is, a, is, is an immunization which we give to patients and which in theory removes the amyloid. And there have been a number of other compounds that we've looked at to do this. And they've not been as helpful as we had hoped. And one of the reasons which I've hinted at while I've been going through the talk is because actually we're not giving them early enough. Because once you've got amyloid in your brain, it's hard to get rid of it. And we know you've been building it up for, for, for perhaps 10 or more years. But interestingly, this particular study, um, which took 166 people with either very mild Alzheimer's disease or this mild cognitive impairment with, with, with amyloid in their brain. So people relatively early in the course of this um, long condition. 
Um, and what it showed was that on the amyloid PET scan, this was a patient at the start of the trial, and this was a patient a year later. And I think, again, you don't need um, to, 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 to look too closely to see that there is a reduction in the amount of amyloid. Now, we have to be very careful about this, because that's great, but we don't actually know if the patient was any better. Um, and the, this is a crucial element of all of this, is it's all very well removing all the amyloid, but if the person at the end of the day is no better from their functioning, their daily life, etc., it may not be very uh, useful as, from, a, from a patient and clinical point of view. So we always need to put together with the scan the actual uh, other elements. But it's still quite exciting showing that we can potentially um, remove the amyloid. And finally, what I want to talk about is, is something that's in research, which I think is even more exciting. And this is uh, something that now does exactly the same thing, except these compounds bind to the tangles. So they bind to this tau protein, and I've just put a picture of a tangle up there to remind you what they look like. Now, the interesting thing about tangles in the brain is we know that as your memory gets worse and your dementia gets worse, you develop more tangles in the brain. The number of tangles in the brain relates to the problems you have with memory and thinking. That is not true of amyloid. So it would naturally suggest that tangles are a more sort of reasonable target, possibly, to try and uh, improve or remove because we know that as they get worse, your dementia gets worse. And this is uh, showing uh, a picture. Uh, on the top, we've got someone who's had that, the amyloid scan that I've shown you before. And you can see this is a, a normal subject. This is a normal subject who actually has no symptoms. But clearly, I would not like that to be my brain, um, in that it clearly has a lot of amyloid. And this is someone with Alzheimer's uh, dementia. And then using the tau marker, you can see this is a normal subject. And you can see the pattern is quite different. And if you remember the pictures I showed you at the beginning of the structure of the brain, this is exactly that temporal lobe, that hippocampus area of the brain that I said was so important in memory uh, and Alzheimer's. And you can see this is a normal subject, but again, given that, you would be worried that this person is on the way to developing Alzheimer's disease. And this is someone actually with uh, Alzheimer's. Again, you can see just how um, that has, uh, has changed. And this uh, also uh, illustrates... Um, the difference that I mentioned that we've always got to remember about age as well as everything else. So on the left here you've got young subjects who have nice blue brains. Uh, on the right you've got Alzheimer's people with the tau tracer which are quite red. Older subjects who are normal and are negative for amyloid so they don't have amyloid in their brain so we don't think they're in, in the process of developing Alzheimer's. They're not as good as the young subjects but they're not too bad but the ones who are amyloid positive do show a bit more, and again showing that this is a, a way. So the, combining these two together is quite interesting. And then this final one, this shows uh, a similar thing. This shows young controls and older controls. And again, you can see that the older subjects have just got a little bit of the tau showing up as that greeny-blue colour. On the other hand, if the people have amyloid in their brain, this is a normal subject who's amyloid positive, this is someone who's got some mild memory problems, who's amyloid positive, and this is someone with Alzheimer's. And you can see that it's increasing across this um, thing. Whereas on the other hand, if we take uh, subjects with non-Alzheimer's dementia who are getting worse from a cognitive point of view, in other words, their memory's in, uh, getting worse, they are negative because they don't actually have Alzheimer's disease. They have another form of dementia. And this is beginning to help us to really work out quite a lot of exciting new information. So what's the future of, of tau uh, scanning? Well, several hundred scans have been done so far. Um, the results are very promising, but as I say, it's, it's, uh, it's a research tool. Um, because it seems to relate to the amount of memory problems that you have, and it gets worse as the dementia gets worse, it potentially could be what we call a surrogate marker. In other words, it could be giving us a marker that really does help us say your dementia is worse and we can look to see um, if it improves and, and, and that the dementia is better. We still have to remember that that has to relate to everyday activities and memory as, as well. But potentially, this looks the most promising of the markers we've had so far. And if it's true that that is the case, we would anticipate that in research studies we would need to study much less numbers of subjects. The, the studies we do at the moment to find new treatments for Alzheimer's involve a thousand or more patients in centres across different countries in Europe and the US. Um, and, um, and as such, uh, 
Um, if we could get that information with less number of patients, we potentially would spend less money on the trials and we would hopefully see the drugs coming along a little bit quicker. So this is really quite exciting. So I haven't talked about all the things you can do and if you came to the rest of the conference, uh, which is pretty high powered stuff and quite a bit of it's above my head, um, and um, there's a lot of other things going on that scanning is doing. There's a lot of research going on improving ways of using MRI, for example, so that you can actually use MRI almost as, a, 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 as an alternative to PET to look at things. But what I started talking about was structure of the brain with CT and MRI. Then I went on to talk to you about function and looking at the metabolism and the, and the blood supply to the brain. Um, there are one or two other things that we can do. These are some of the clever things we can do on, on, on the right there. And then finally what I talked about was actually molecular imaging where we're, we're looking at the amyloid molecules, we're looking at the, the tau molecules. So a lot going on. So uh, in the light of what my title was or the title I was given, um, I think there's no doubt that brain imaging, I hope I've shown you this, can help in making the diagnosis of dementia and also the subtype of dementia. And it's moved on a lot um, from, from over the last uh, few years. It can help to predict and follow the progression of normal or mildly impaired people to dementia and it also looks if we can use it to follow disease progression in someone who actually has dementia and whether they're responding to treatments. Um, it's possible that these techniques, if they improve sufficiently, they may become what we we'll call a gold standard because they are uh, very precise and even to the point perhaps where we may no longer need the post-mortem to confirm the diagnosis, that, 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 that may be a possibility, although we're away from having demonstrated that. Both amyloid and tau are exciting but they're, and useful, but they are expensive. And as I've said, as we get to the point where we're hoping within the next few years, maybe even later this year, although certainly over the next few years, we're expecting some of these treatments for Alzheimer's disease that are very specific to amyloid, they will need to be given to people who definitely have amyloid in their brain. And at that point, we may see um, that people like the, 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 the NHS says that before you can receive the treatment, you have to have one of these scans or some other method, which you, you, there are other methods that are looking at this, to try and confirm that you've really got Alzheimer's disease before you receive a relatively expensive treatment that would do you no good if you don't actually have the, the disease. And I, again, I just want to come back. I'm talking about imaging, I'm being positive about it, but, but I still would emphasize, I'm a clinician, I don't diagnose my patients on the basis of the pictures that I see there. They have to be interpreted in the light of the symptoms that the person has, but there's no doubt that over the last 10, 15 years that I'm getting more and more useful information from the brain scans that really help us to try and tease out what diagnosis somebody has. The good news for people who live in Bath is that we will have a PET scanner as of next week available and we are starting to use it. And we know it's an important event because Mary Berry is coming to open it. Um, and, uh, and I believe, I've checked with my colleagues, you will have one in Bristol I think by the beginning of next year. So these scanners which have been not very readily available are, are coming and we certainly can use them very readily now for the, 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 the functional imaging. So the, the, the thing using the glucose to look at the metabolism, a bit like the SPECT scans, that is readily available and we will be using that for patients where we're not sure about the diagnosis. The issues about whether we can use amyloid imaging in our routine patients is still being developed. There are protocols coming along. It, 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 they're probably costing about £1,500 a scan. Um, whereas a CT scan is probably about £150, so you can understand some of the, the issues about it. Um, I'd like to thank anyone whose slides I pinched for the talk and haven't mentioned their name, but in particular I'd like to mention Nick Fox, Richard Graham, John O'Brien and Mike Weiner, who really have been incredibly generous at giving me some of those lovely pictures. And finally, this is Rice. This is our nice new building at the RUH. Um, in 2008, we moved there where we do our memory clinic and our research. If anyone's interested in taking part in research with us, you can find more um, from our website um, and uh, we will uh, be happy to talk to you. And in connection with that, we have a recruitment event for our research, which I'm told I had to finish by mentioning. On the 6th of July, in the Postgraduate Medical Centre at the RUH, there will be an afternoon from 2 to 5 for anyone who's interested in
um, in taking part in research involving people with memory problems and dementia. There'll be, uh, you'll have to hear me again, I'm afraid that's a negative of, the, of, of coming, but you'll also be able to hear from some of the patients who take part in the research and, and, and who've had experience of that. And the other thing that many of you may also be aware of is this uh, initiative called Join Dementia Research, which is also about trying to encourage everybody to, to take part, because without the people who help us in our research, we can't progress uh, any further. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. If, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Or is it such a hot afternoon? Okay, I've got to repeat the question because uh, for the recording so they know what. I think if I heard you correctly, that is, it, is it amyloid causing tau or tau causing amyloid or whatever? I think there's still some debate about that. I think what we know is that people, there are a number of people who inherit genes which inevitably causes them to develop Alzheimer's disease. Those people who've inherited those genes, they all have an impact on amyloid. There's also one of those genes, there's a, 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 an Icelandic version on the same bit of the, of the gene, which if you inherit that, it protects you against Alzheimer's disease. So it does seem that there are very clearly amyloid-related issues that are very fundamental, certainly in that group of people. Um, and, uh, and we know that you can develop dementia with tau and tangles on its own, and some other dementias, which I haven't really talked in detail about, but some of the frontal dementias, for example, people have tangles, but they don't have amyloid in their brain. So tangles on their own can cause uh, dementia, but the relationship between the two, I think, is still being sorted out. But I think that those genetic patients, who, because the, the, the tau genetic abnormalities develop frontotemporal dementia rather than Alzheimer's disease. So it does imply that there's something pretty fundamental uh, with something going on with amyloid, but I, I, it's, it's certainly not 100% clear. Is it just genetic, or is it genetic and amyloid? What is the environmental causes? The, yeah, sorry, the, uh, that question was, uh, is it just genetic, or, is, or are there environmental causes? I think the answer is certainly isn't just genetic. Um, what we know is it's very rare to inherit a gene that will automatically ensure you will definitely get Alzheimer's disease. Those families are really rare, but they are very useful at helping us to study uh, research. And if any of you saw the program on Horizon a few weeks back, they were talking about a family, a, a whole group in Colombia, who, who are, uh, who've been really generous in taking part in research, and they have a g gene that they all know about. That's not the usual case, and very few of the patients that we see are in that position. There are some families in, in, the, in the UK that, that, where that is the case. So that's a gene that causes Alzheimer's. There are what we call susceptibility genes. The, the most widely known one is called APOE, APOE4, and if you inherit APOE4, you are more likely to get Alzheimer's disease. If you inherit two copies of APOE4, you're even more likely, um, but you can still get Alzheimer's disease with no copies of it. So it's a bit like some of the genes for things like breast cancer and other things where if you inherit them, you may have a slightly higher risk, but it's not a gene that guarantees that you will get it. Having said that, this group who have inherited two copies of APOE, in other words, one from APOE4 from their mother and, and their father, they are now a focus for us to look at research because we know they are at a higher risk uh, of, of developing dementia. So they're becoming a, a group that might be able to help us. There are also some other genes that have been identified now. None of them are quite as strong, and they have a variety of actions. There's some have still been worked out, but for example, some of them seem to have an action on inflammation, and we actually believe that inflammation is quite important in the development of Alzheimer's disease. And interestingly, and I haven't talked about it today, there are now some scans coming which are targeting looking at inflammation in the brain so that we can identify that. And then on top of that, there are, as you say, environmental factors and whatever. What we know is that, that in general, if you want to try and stop yourself getting dementia or Alzheimer's, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. We know that midlife risk factors for Alzheimer's include uh, your blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, 
um, obesity. So all the things that, in effect, uh, you know, we sh we're all being encouraged to, to, to reduce anyway are actually risk factors for you developing Alzheimer's disease in later life. Um, so there are exercise is, is, is another factor. So there are a number of things. So, so, so they do play a part. But exactly what triggers the, the, the mechanism, uh, again, we're not sure. For example, uh, it's probably topical at the moment, uh, although Muhammad Ali did not have Alzheimer's disease, we know that brain trauma and severe head injuries, for example, if for someone who's, say, been unconscious for a period of time after, say, a road traffic accident, some of those people are more at risk of Alzheimer's disease uh, later on. And we think that's because amyloid may develop in response to the head injury, and in uh, some people it doesn't switch off, it just carries on, whereas in other people after the head injury has gone, it, it doesn't. So that's another group that we know are potentially at risk. Um, so there are, there are things, and as I say, there's increasing interest, uh, certainly footballers, rugby players is a big issue now about concussion, um, and American footballers, there's been a, a, an issue about whether repeated minor concussion or, or, or more often whether that's damaging to the brain as well.